Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Charlie Firestone from the Aspen Institute and want to welcome everybody here and thank Alma and Joseph Gildenhorn for sponsoring this series in the Alma and Joseph Gildenhorn room, uh, but they have sponsored this great book series. Walter Isaacson, sorry he can't be with us, but we are pleased uh, to have a uh, senior correspondent and star Emmy Award winning interviewer and uh, reporter from the PBS NewsHour who will interview and introduce our uh, featured guest, Jeffrey Brown. Uh, welcome to you all. First of all, can everybody hear all right? Good. I have to make sure of that. It's a pleasure for me to be here and a pleasure to be talking to Sebastian Younger. Uh, it's a wonderful <coughs> book and a movie to come, which I've also had the pleasure of seeing. We'll talk about that. You'll all have a chance to see it later on. Sebastian Younger is, of course, well known as a uh, writer. Uh, but more importantly, I just learned that we both grew up in the same town, uh, Belmont, Massachusetts. I knew that he'd written a book about Belmont, a death in Belmont. I didn't realize we're from the same town. A couple of years apart. I'm so much younger than you are. <laughs> Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, anyway, Sebastian is, of course, well known for The Perfect Storm, his book, uh, A Death in Belmont and Now War. And the film coming out is called Restrepo, which won at the uh, documentary competition at the Sundance Film Festival. So please join me in welcoming Sebastian Younger. Thank you. And we will uh, talk for about 20, 25 minutes or so, and then there'll be time for you to ask questions. Why don't we start with um, the beginning? How did this book come about? How did, how did this effort come about? I've, I've been covering wars since 1993 when I first went to Bosnia as a freelancer. Um, I've been in, in Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, and Kosovo, and Afghanistan in 1996. And, um, so I'd been in a lot of wars, but, but I had never been with U.S. forces. And in 2005, um, you know, I, was, I was in Afghanistan in 2001. I watched the, the fall of the Taliban. Everyone thought, wow, that was easy. Um, uh, in my opinion, the effort there after that was, was under-resourced, under uh, undermanned, and the war just went on and on. By 2005, it clearly was not going away, and I decided I wanted to have some experience with soldiers from my country. And um, so I was with battle, I was just randomly placed by the public affairs officer at Bagram with uh, Battle Company of the 173rd Airborne. I was with one platoon out in the mountains for about a week, uh, very rough operation. But I was just amazed by these guys. I was amazed by Captain McGarry um, uh, and, uh, and all of his men. It really, they just really awed me. And I thought if these guys go back to Afghanistan, I want to follow one platoon for a whole deployment. Um, I was not interested in Iraq for various reasons. Uh, Afghanistan is a country I've, I've spent a lot of time in. I'm very concerned about it, very fond of it. Um, and as it happened, uh, Battle Company was sent to the Korangal Valley of eastern Afghanistan. And so I wound up there in uh, June 2007 with the idea of writing a book and making a documentary about one platoon on a combat tour. So it was, it was from the beginning the idea of focusing in on a small group of, of men. Yes, what I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to do something that was outside of the um, very understandable and contentious politics about the war. I, I, wa I had the idea that the experience of combat for a soldier emotionally doesn't change much war to war uh, century to century, and I wanted to understand that experience, and it seemed like, partly because of the contentious nature of, of the two wars that we're in, um, that that experience was being sort of overlooked by the press. Um, also, I had the luxury, working for Vanity Fair magazine, of not having an imminent deadline. Um, I was able to take as many trips as I wanted. I did five one-month <coughs> trips with this platoon. They were in a very remote place. Um, Another aspect of this that interested me was the dynamics within a small group. Uh, in Iraq, many of, the, uh, many of the U.S. forces are on big bases, and the dynamics of a small group, which can get very intense, uh, I imagine would be kind of diluted uh, by the context. Um, out at uh, OP Outpost Restrepo, where I spent uh, off and on most of a year, 
um, there was nothing diluting those dynamics, and they were really fascinating. Why don't we set up this the the place a little bit for those who haven't read it? The outpost Restrepo, and it's named after a fallen soldier, medic. Yeah, the, the battle company, 150 men of battle company, were in the Korangal Valley, six miles long in eastern Afghanistan, Kunar province. Which you call the Afghanistan of Afghanistan. Yeah, what it's, is, I mean, meaning it's sort of even locally, you know, within Kunar, it was known as, it's like one of these, uh, you know, like remote valleys in Tennessee where everyone's bootlegging, uh, you know, and, and every, everyone's carrying a shotgun and the feds don't dare go in there. I mean, it was kind of like that in Afghanistan. Too um, remote to conquer, too poor to intimidate, too autonomous to buy off. That's the way you put it in the book. And that was their reputation among other Afghans in Kunar. So you can imagine these were very tough people. Um, when I got there, um, I was not prepared for the amount of combat that was happening there. I mean, Afghanistan was called the the other war, the forgotten war, even battle company, the soldiers themselves, the main thing that they were worried about uh, was that they wouldn't see any combat. I mean, these are airborne infantry. They want to, they want to get into it. That's why they joined. Uh, they were afraid they wouldn't be in any combat, and little did they know. Um, in this six-mile-long valley, one fi for a while, one-fifth of all the combat in all of Afghanistan uh, was, was happening in that valley. So 150 men of Battle Company were absorbing a fifth of the combat for 70,000 NATO troops uh, for a period while I was there. Um, the main base was called the, the Korangal Outpost, the COP. Uh, it had a LZ, a landing, uh, a landing zone for helicopters. Um, but it was surrounded by high grounds, and the enemy, of course, would use the high ground to shoot down into the, into the position. Um, so the command decided to take over some of that high ground with an outpost. Uh, the men walked up there in the middle of the night um, with shovels and picks and rifles, and they started digging. And they dug furiously all night long, filling sandbags, um, trying to build up. I mean, and there wasn't any sand up there. I mean, it was all rock. So they would chip away at the rock with pickaxes and fill up the bags, and they called them rock bags. And uh, they were attacked 13 times in the ensuing 24 hours. They worked and fought nonstop for 24 hours to start building that base. Um, there was no running water up there, so they couldn't bathe for a month at a time. Every month, they'd go down to the cop to take a shower. Um, there was no internet. There was no phone. There was no connection with the outside world. There was no cooked food. Um, it was, they were basically on Mars. And you know there were days that I was out there that the position was attacked. I mean, not sniper fire or something, but the position was attacked uh, four or five times in one day. It was relentless. That, that, that isolation comes through so much in the book, and, and then you see it in the film, but uh, to the point where, as you say, at times they were unrecognizable as soldiers. I mean, of course, they had guns and they were fighting, but I'm talking about the look. They would wear shorts, uh, flip-flops. Uh, yeah, I mean, their uniforms got so shredded up there. It was such rough country um, that, that, you know, their uniforms would be in tatters and they'd have to make do with them until, you know, the month was out. They could go down to the cop and burn their, burn their uniform and get a new one. Um, uh, and, you know, they would, um, they wore amulets. You know, there was a lot of, everyone there had a close call, many close calls, including, including me. Um, there were guys up there with holes in their uniforms from bullets that had gone through the fabric but not touched them. Uh, every person up there had a story like that. And so they wore, sorry, good luck amulets and, um, as it got hot, they would wear, um, you know, just shorts and flip-flops that they made out of uh, packing foam from missile crates. And, uh, and, you know, if the outpost got hit suddenly on a hot day, everyone, you know, it, it just looks like some weird, you know, like homeless beach volleyball team with, with, with very heavy weapons. I mean, they would, you know, they would jump on the guns and you'd see these guys literally in shorts and flip-flops. They didn't have time to put their gear on in shorts and flip-flops, you know, blasting away with the 50 cal. I mean, it really just visually was pretty extraordinary looking. Now how, uh, you, you had a lot of experience in war and you've been around soldiers, but if you plop yourself down in a place like this with a, with a small unit, how do, how do you find a way in um, so that they trust you, so that you're there to able and able to observe while all this goes on without getting in the way, without interfering, without changing what's happening, especially because you had a camera in this case as well. Yeah. Oh, it's a good question. I, I, I think as soon as you have a camera, things change. I mean, there's no way to avoid it. It's just the deal that you make, um, that society makes for having press coverage. Um, 
And I definitely thought that there were times in the beginning where there was maybe, there was like one guy in the platoon I thought sort of hammed it up a bit in combat if the camera was sort of near him. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, he didn't need to. It was so outrageous what was going on there. Um, but um, I, I mean, I got close to those guys progressively. Uh, the first trip, they're always polite. They're always fairly formal, um, sort of anodyne answers to questions. I joined a, you know, I joined the army to serve my country, sir. You know, stuff like that. Stuff that's not particularly interesting journalistically. Um, I did five one-month trips, and, and trip after trip, I got to know them. I got close to these guys, closer to some than in others. Um, they saw the first article I wrote for Vanity Fair, and they saw that it was a, um, that it was fair and unbiased, and they really appreciated that. Um, I was working with Tim Hetherington, an uh, amazing photographer. We were both shooting video. Uh, Tim broke his ankle uh, in combat on the top of the Abascar Ridge and walked all night on a broken leg um, to get down off the ridge. There was no other way to get him down. Um, and had he sort of been a crybaby up there, he, would have, he, he literally could have caused um, guys to get uh, killed or wounded. Um, they were in a very bad place. So he toughed it out. The guys appreciated that. Um, I got, uh, I was blown up by an IED. Uh, the Humvee I was in was blown up by an IED. Um, I, you know, it, it, it had a profound, we were all physically okay. It had a profound effect on me psychologically, but I was very committed to these guys and to this project. And, you know, I continued with my trip and kept going back. And I think, you know, as soldiers, they, they appreciate, I think they took note of the fact that Tim and I were doing something we didn't need to do to chronicle their experience um, and they bought in. They bought into the project and by the end they were speaking to, the, to us or even into the video camera with an honesty and an openness um, and a sincerity that I think very few journalists have the, the, the honor of, uh, of experiencing. They were, it was a really amazing bond we had with them by the end. I'm curious uh, journalistically, did you um did you decide, did you talk to them about privacy issues or things that you might, that might be off the record at times or that, you know, they might say something in the, at, at a given moment? Do you then say, do you mind if I tell this story? Were there cases like that? I'm trying to think. Um, there was one time when a guy started crying and I turned off the video camera just out of, um, I was interviewing him about the death of a friend, uh, of uh, Juan Restrepo, the medic. Um, that the outpost was named after, and he started crying, and I turned off the camera. Um, there, of course, if you're living with people, they're, after they adjust to you, they're carrying on with their lives. They're having conversations. I mean, they know you're there in some abstract sense, but they forget you're there. And they're having conversations about, you know, their wives or their families or their own problems. And they're not, you know, these are 19, 20-year-old guys. Um, they forget that Reporters write things down. They really do forget that. And, I, and I, I had a pretty good sense, I thought I had a pretty good sense of things that um, weren't important sort of militarily, but that could have been devastating personally. And so in some very limited instances in the book, I would contact the soldier and say, hey, you know, particularly this guy, Brendan O'Byrne, who was shot by his father in an argument, uh, very dysfunctional family, a lot of alcoholism in the family and um, he was shot by his father and um, it was a pretty compelling story and after I wrote that section I, I sent it to him and I said listen the last thing I this is your private life um, the last thing I want to do is cause you more problems than you're already dealing with let me know how you feel about this and he read it and he thought it was actually quite helpful to him to his family and to <laughs> readers in general and he said this is this is a good thing. Um, let's let's keep that in the book. So there were specific cases where I tried to be um, sort of have a conscience about it, basically. Uh, there's a lot of uh, action here, obviously, and a lot of violence. But and we can we can go into that as well. But I also want to ask you, and you sort of referred to this earlier. Clearly, what you were trying to do here was understand something about these guys, about the nature of war. Uh, the idea of courage, of fear, of the psychology going on. Is that something you started with? I mean, is that something you went there to, to look at as well as just sort of documenting their lives? Or did you go and, and it come to you as you, were, as you were in the midst of it? 
It came to me as I was in the midst of it. Um, I, the, the idea was not very formed in my mind when I started. Uh, I wanted to chronicle the experience of one platoon. I wanted to write a book and shoot a documentary. Um, but when I got there, I mean, immediately, we, you know, we were in a pretty big ambush, pretty good firefight. We were sort of trapped behind this rock wall. We were getting hit by, you know, from about 270 degrees. Um, and, um, you know, you could see bullets incoming rounds sparking off the top of the wall, right? And the wall, behind the wall, we were completely safe. Above the wall, you were potentially instantly dead. And I watched these, but the only safety in a firefight really comes, uh, comes from returning fire uh, and overwhelming the enemy with firepower. And under the cover of that, you can get out, get to a safe place. You know, I watched guys stand up and shoot back. And um, I, I found it, with a video camera, almost impossible to stick my head above the wall. I managed to do it, and the way I did it was I was next to a soldier named Kim. I didn't know him. I got to know him later. But um, So he'd be down, and he'd pop up to shoot, and then he'd go down again. And I got into his rhythm, and we, when he popped up, I popped up, and when he went down, I went. And just doing this with another person, I mean, it wouldn't have affected the chances of me getting hit or, hit, you know, whatever. But, but psychologically, it was, it was far easier. Um, but I would try to talk to those guys later about courage. They were, I saw two guys run through very heavy gunfire. I mean, bullets were puffing the dirt, you know, on the ground, and they ran through very heavy machine gun fire to grab a guy who was hurt to drag him to safety. He'd been hit uh, at the outpost before it was fully built. Um, and I would talk, you know, they were potentially committing suicide out there. That's, you know, that's courage. For, for a civilian, that's courage, right? And I tried to get them to talk about this thing called courage, and they just, they really wouldn't do it. And the reason, it was almost a kind of semantic thing. They were like, look, A, that's my friend out there lying in the dirt taking fire. Uh, B, that's what soldiers do. So I'm, I'm filling my, by running out there to save him, I'm filling my minimum requ requirement as a friend, as a brother of that guy, and as a soldier. That's not courage, that's just doing what you're supposed to do. Um, a woman who runs into traffic to save her three-year-old child, you know, who ran into traffic, you know, and she chases after her child to save, save her kid from being hit by a car, that's not courage, that's being a mother, right? A parent. Um, that's how the soldiers saw it. And so, it was quite hard to talk about courage, but I became increasingly interested in it because it was so clearly um, the sort of sine qua non of combat. I mean, without courage, it, 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 it wouldn't work. No one could function out there. Um, and that brought in a whole conversation in my mind, a whole investigation into fear. Um, fear, courage is essentially conquering your fear and, func and, and functioning. So I had to find out how fear worked. And so it started this whole um, line of inquiry in my book uh, but, that, but it occurred to me as I was out there and watching these events unfold. But I, I mean, I was curious because a, a mutual acquaintance of ours is your publisher, Jonathan Karp. When I told him um, that I was going to be talking to you, he said, you know, um, Sebastian was an anthropology major in college. And then certain things sort of clicked. Yeah, I studied anthropology in college. Uh, I spent a summer on the Navajo Indian Reservation. Uh, I wrote a thesis about long distance run Navajo long distance runners. I was a, I was a, a pretty good runner in college um, and afterwards, and I trained with their best guys, and I wrote a thesis, which is what got me writing. But because of that, um, I kind of see things anthropologically. So when the guys, um, the guys had a, 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 a violent little initiation ritual for each other, Whenever they, I don't know, maybe you're going to get to this later. I mean, <laughs> no, jump, go, jump ahead. Ahead or, go ahead. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, it was a very, very dangerous place up there. It was very remote. And as Brendan said to me, Brendan O'Byrne said to me, there are guys in the platoon who straight up hate each other, but we would all die for each other. That's an extraordinary and, ex and, and very profound relationship to have with another human being. Um, probably one you can't find in civilian society except between family members, and maybe not even then. Um, and so um, the guys had a kind of ritual way of making it clear to the group and to the individuals that they were all willing to uh, um, abide by that code. And um, it was essentially an initiation rite. 
And as soon as I saw it happen, I, I thought of every, all the anthropological literature I'd read, every society in the world, every tribal society in the world has initi uh, male initiation rites. Um, I'm sure they go back tens of thousands of years. And that's what I was watching up there. I mean, in my mind, that's what I was watching. Um, what they would do, if you left the position to go on leave, you had 18-day leave over the course of 15 months. Um, when you left the position to go on leave, you got blooded out, which meant that the platoon jumped on you and beat you. Um, not to damage you, or they didn't damage you too badly. It was mainly a kind of, it was a ritual beating. Um, uh, and then when you came back, you got blooded in. And I think what it signified it is basically the group saying to the individual, you are ours now. You will serve us and we will serve you. Um, but in, in one of the more remarkable scenes here, they do that to the incoming lieutenant, I think. Lieutenant. Now so, that now, right. that it's one thing to fight right. each other if you're of the same rank, but a lieutenant comes in from the outside from a platoon which had been having some trouble, right? Yeah. So there's some question about, is yeah. he a good leader or not? Yeah. And they, they beat the guy up. Well, they, 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 I don't think they hit him as hard. Okay. <laughs> they jumped the guy, which is a strange welcome to your commander. I, uh, but, you know, I talked to them about it later, and they said, you know, we, we were prepared to trust this guy. We know he's a nice guy. We weren't sure if he was a good leader or not. Uh, but it was, a, it was a sign of respect. And he understood it to be that. Um, and I talked to him about it later. Um, and, I mean, essentially what they were demonstrating to him is, look, you might be the lieutenant, but you're also another man up here and you are now part of this group. It was a sort of ritual way of signifying we are, we are a family now. Um, and I gotta say, if you're not willing to be a good sport about being beaten, you probably won't through, run through gunfire to save someone's life. I think in a weird way, I think they were probably pretty spot on about that. Um, and um, it worked. Uh, it, it worked very, very well up there in a very odd way. So it, it, just to continue this, uh, trying to explore this um, issue of comradeship versus the barbarity of war, there's a point where you describe where the troops, um, they cheer after a Taliban fighter has been uh, killed. And, and just to give a little of the context, uh, if I remember it right, the Taliban fighter has been spotted off in the distance without a leg, so he's crawling. And then I think maybe either someone shoots him or the helicopter's brought in, he's killed and everyone on the outpost cheers. And you have a moment where you, you're troubled. You, say, you write, it seemed like I either had to radically re-understand the men on the hilltop, or I had to acknowledge the power of a place like this to change them. And I thought that was an interesting moment because you had seen plenty of violence already and you sort of knew what they were like. So why did that coalesce for you in something like that? And how did you decide how to react? Yeah, that was a complicated moment. I mean, I understood the need for all the firepower because there was a lot of firepower directed at us, and it, I mean, that's war, right? I understood it. Um, what, what was odd for me was the cheering. I mean, here is this guy, an enemy fighter, who is crawling on, on a baking hot day, crawling around on this dusty hillside, a 50 cal had taken his leg off. I'm sure he was completely disoriented and terrified and probably extremely thirsty. Um, when you're thirsty, you get and when you're wounded, you get thirsty immediately, and it's a very hot day. So, you know, he was really suffering the torments of the damned on this hillside. And the guys very rarely saw the Taliban. The fighting was at several hundred meters. They very rarely actually saw, saw the fighters themselves. So they saw this guy in his agonies, and then he, he was killed, and they cheered. And I asked them about it later because the cheering seemed unnecessary. I mean, I get, the, I get the need to kill the guy. I didn't quite get the need to, to be uh, jubilant about it. I mean, it's another, per, it's another human being. You know, he died in agony. So I asked them about I asked this one guy, Steiner, about it. Now, Steiner had taken a round in the helmet uh, in a very bad firefight in Ali, a town called Aliabad. Um, a tiny difference of angle had saved his life. The round bounced off his helmet. I mean, he's incredibly lucky. So I asked Steiner about it, and he said, I know how it sounds, you know. By this time, Steiner and I knew each other very well. He said, look, we were cheering because that's one more guy who's not going to kill my brother tomorrow. That's one more guy who's not going to kill me. That's one guy who's not going to keep me from going home to my girlfriend and my family. 
um, we were cheering the fact that we were a little bit safer and a little bit closer to home now that that guy was dead. And, um, you know, I, it made sense to me. I, you know, I wasn't stuck out there. They were. And, I, you know, if I got myself freaked out and a couple of times I almost did, I could just go home. They couldn't. They had to make it 15 months. And this was the one of the ways that they, that they dealt with the incredible levels of fear that they tolerated for that time is one of the ways I think that they dealt with it. You know, um, I think everyone who knows your work knows that you're, you're, you're well known for exploring these uh, kind of extremes of, uh, of, of life, of war, et cetera. I want to ask you about your own stance as a reporter in, in this or um, putting yourself into this experience uh, so that you're in danger as well. How, what is your journalistic voice? Is that something you think about, um, how you're going to tell a story, how much to put yourself into the story? And I, I guess I have an advantage because I've seen the film as well. So you're, you're more in the book than you are in the film, although you are behind the camera, clearly, right. you and your, your colleague. But I'm curious how you feel about your own putting yourself in the story and... and yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, as for the film, I'm not in the... Tim and I are not in the film at all. I feel like there's a very bad um, sort of tendency recently to turn the, the uh, reporters into part of the story um, in, war, in, in combat reporting. I feel like reporters are more... And more I don't mean stand-ups. I mean, like, in the action. You know, there's the reporter in the firefight. And I, and I you know, I just, like... As a journalist, I sort of like resist that. We definitely did not want to do that in the film. But in the book, um, I was having an experience out there as well. I've never written in the first person. I've always resisted it. And then I realized I was having an experience where I was having to process a lot of the same emotional issues that the soldiers were, just in, from a slightly different position. I was not carrying a weapon. I didn't have to deal with killing people. I had to deal with being friends with someone who was killing someone and cheering it. Um, I could leave, but while I was there, I had to deal with my own fear. If I became incapacitated by my own fear, I was going to create a problem in the, pl in the platoon with the group on a patrol. Maybe someone would get hit, so maybe someone would get killed. Um, if, I, if my body failed me, I'm in pretty good shape, but it was pretty outrageously hard physically out there. If my body failed me in some way, or my, my mind failed me in trying to tell my body to do something, Again, I could get someone killed, so I had to deal with all these issues, and I felt that the way I was processing this stuff gave me a, a, a portal into how the soldiers had to process uh, these issues. It was close enough to be of some value. In addition, I think readers, civilians, have a very hard time identifying with soldiers. They're highly trained. They're, they're very, very tough 20-year-old men. Uh, I'm not a soldier. Um, I'm in my mid-40s. The reactions that I have out there are going to be very common human reactions. And as the reader, what I'm, I was hoping is that you, the reader, can see my struggles out there psychologically, physically, and think, okay, um, that's probably what it would be like if I, the reader, were out there. I'm getting a pretty good, I good idea what it would feel like to be there myself. And of course, that's the goal of any writer is to make the reader feel like he or she is there. And that was, um, using my own experiences was how I did that. Well, you've, since you've also just raised the, the way that wars are covered these days, let me ask you about this notion. You were embedded with, the, with, the, with the, the platoon. And you know there's been some debate in journalistic circles about the use of that uh, in covering wars. I mean, you, you, you get right in there, but it also limits your scope. And there's a point where you say, that you were, quote, entirely dependent on the U.S. military for food, shelter, security, and transportation. Now, I assume in your case, you just decided that was the deal to allow you to get this close and this tight with this group. I, I mean, yes, that's the deal with any embedded reporter. Well, you know, once you're in the military bubble, you are completely um, at their, um, not at their mercy is the wrong word, but um, you're, 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 you're within the command structure and um, there are things you can't do, and you're very dependent on them. Uh, but, you know, that, I mean, that's true of pretty much any war I've ever covered. I mean, you know, in Liberia, I was definitely at the mercy of the gov you know, government child soldiers who were fighting off LERD, you know, outside Monrovia. I mean, that's just, that's what happens in a, um, in a conflict where you're on one side. 
uh, you're dependent on them, and, and you start to bond with them. It's unavoidable. I, I think it's just part of journalism. Um, I think it's very dangerous to pretend that you're not doing that. When you pretend that you're completely independent of the process that's happening around you, then you really are in danger of making errors. I became quite fascinated by my lack of objectivity. My, um, the bond, the increase. Fascinated by it? Yeah, I, I really was. I mean, the, the ideal is that you, you're completely objective, right? That's the ideal. It's totally unattainable. So let's talk about um, how, uh, let's talk about how we can't get to that ideal. Let's talk about what happens when you're with, um, when you're with uh, soldiers. Uh, let's talk about that bond, because the bond that you start to feel with them mirrors the bond that they feel with each other. It's actually an interesting way of understanding them. Um, I'm getting shot at out there. I almost got killed out there. A bullet hit three inches from my head during one firefight. It sprayed my face with dirt. There were people out there trying to kill me and the people I was with. I'm not going to be objective about those people. Um, the bond that I, I'm sorry, you know, I don't, I don't think the frontline reporters in World War II were objective about the Nazis. I don't think they should have been. Um, uh, the bond that I had with the guys in the platoon was the least of my problems in regards to objectivity. But it was also a very interesting problem, and I really sort of studied it. I examined it. Um, it became one of the, uh, you know, in some ways, one of the more fascinating things about the experience. Let me ask you just one more thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open this up. Um, another thing that happens to interest me a lot is this tradition <clears throat> of writing about war, uh, which you clearly had to fit yourself into. Now, I'm curious how aware of you, how aware were you of that tradition? Were there models that you uh, wanted to emulate or to avoid? Um, this is much on my mind. I just recently had the occasion to talk to Tim O'Brien on the, I guess it's the 20th anniversary of the things they carried. But as someone who reads a lot of, uh, of war memoirs and, and, and war reporting, um, how much did you know about it and, 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 and how much do you think about that tradition? I didn't read anything from the current conflicts uh, intentionally. Um, any, I didn't read any books about, uh, about them. Um, probably the most significant book on war, report, on war that I read by a reporter was uh, Michael Hare's Dispatches. It's sort of the touchstone, you know. Right. It, it's sort of the classic. Um, and I mean, yeah, it was you know, Vietnam was a very, very different war. Um, but he really, he really wove a first-person experience with the broader situation. Um, and his individual relationships with soldiers. He really wove that together beautifully. Um, he also did an interesting thing where his narrative, the narrative in his book is kind of timeless. I mean, he t he's wandering around thematically inside his book rather than telling a completely linear story. And he's not presenting it as linear. He really is following his train of thought and moving into these different topics. And it's, a, it's kind of dreamy. And, and I had a narrative problem with my story, which was the, the, the really dramatic stuff, the really tragic stuff. All the casualties happened in the first third of the deployment. And then Battle Company figured it out. They figured out how to fight in that valley. They started killing a lot of Taliban, and they stopped taking casualties. Uh, not because they had, ma had massive air power, because on the ground, these guys tactically uh, learned how to fight in that valley. And, um, so my narrative arc suddenly looked sort of like problematic. And, and so I decided instead to, do, to organize my book thematically. They were the three primary emotional experiences of combat as I understood them. They were fear, killing, and love. Love meaning the bond within the, the incredibly strong bond between the members of the platoon. Um, so that sort of opened me up to do a kind of uh, a, a, a narrative that was not um, handcuffed to events as they happened, um, but was more wedded to these sort of really interesting thematic issues. All right. Well, I have more questions, but maybe I'll slip them in as we go here. But let's, yeah, go ahead. We can start. I think we have microphones, so we can start right here. Hello. I'm Hi. Elizabeth Drew. Hi. Hi. I bought your book thinking you were signing it, but it wasn't. It was the book salesman signing it. So. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> Would you Did he say something my, nice? <laughs> Would you please sign my book? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Two kind of closely related questions. A lot of what you say sounds like a description of warfare, 
the bonding, the fear, etc. To what extent was this uh, sui generis to Afghanistan? I mean, you didn't do the same thing for other wars. So were you looking at Afghanistan per se in this in this situation? And although you were this sort of a small look at a small place, did you draw any larger conclusions about the war in Afghanistan? Um, I did not draw larger conclusions. Um, I mean, it's like going to inner city Detroit and drawing conclusions about all of the United States. It's a, it's a, it's not a microcosm of the whole. It's a, it's a very specific place, and it was very violent while I was there. There was a lot of areas of Afghanistan where there's no fighting at all. Um, I mean, if you pack a fifth of all the combat into six square miles, obviously that leaves room for a lot of places that are, um, thank God, relatively untroubled. Um, my idea was that this, the experience these guys were having was similar to guys in Vietnam and World War II on back to the Siege of Troy. I mean, I really sort of had that idea. And I think I'm, on an emotional level, the emotional terrain of combat, I think I'm pretty correct on that. Um, I was not interested for this project. I was not interested in Afghanistan as a whole. I wasn't interested in George Bush. I was not interested in the whole sort of macro picture. Had the soldiers sat around talking about uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, George Bush, are we right, are we wrong? Had they sat around having those conversations, which I think they probably were more likely to in Vietnam, I don't know, I wasn't there, um, they would have been in the book. I wanted to reproduce the experience of being a soldier in a combat infantry platoon. Um, they didn't talk about politics, so politics were not in the book. That really was my guiding principle. What's these guys' experience? Uh, they did not talk about the wider war at all. Let's go, okay, right here. Uh, thank you, Said Zafar Hashmi from Voice of America Afghanistan Service. Uh, my question to you is, did you ever want to or get an opportunity to go and talk with the other side, meaning the Taliban, and any of their soldiers or fighters, and did, did, did you want that? And the other question that I have is the same thing. Did you talk with the people who fight alongside the US military, the Afghan National Army? And what are some of your thoughts? I know you're saying that it's not political, but some of your thoughts on negotiations with the Taliban that nowadays everyone is going, trying to talk about it on this, one side, which is the foot soldiers, there everyone is agreeing, but the sensitive issue is with the leadership of the Taliban. Does it have any feasibility, or is it going to be possible? Um, okay, I'll go. I'll, <laughs> I'll go back from. I'll start at the end. Um, when I was in uh, when I was in Kabul after 9/11, um, after the Taliban were toppled, I, I was literally getting hugged by people in the street because when they found out I was American. There was something like, I mean, this may, I, I hope this is your experience, I don't know, but there was something like 90% of Afghans were uh, for the American involvement and were thrilled to have been liberated from the Taliban. Um, so my feeling is the populist does, is not very fond of the Taliban. And I think considering the amount of um, suffering the Taliban has imposed on that country, I think it's kind of up to the Afghan people if they should be negotiated with. Um, if the U.S. negotiates with the Taliban and the local, the Afghan population is outraged by that, it's not going to work. Those negotiations will fail anyway. So I feel like the Afghan people, and I don't mean Hamid Karzai, I mean the Afghan people need to be consulted because ultimately the success or failure of those negotiations will depend on them as it, as it should. Is it your sense, excuse me, uh, is it your sense that that's understood? I, I, I actually had the occasion to interview General McChrystal last week for our program, and he said the same thing, of course, that this is, that must be um, accepted uh, through the Afghan people. It must be um, uh, led by them, you know, that we're not going to, we're not going to impose this on them. He said the same thing that you just said, but, but do you believe, do you believe them? I mean, do you believe that they are act acting that way? I, I mean, I have no access to information to the contrary. So, um, but I should say, I mean, stepping back a little bit, um, I think it must be very painful and puzzling for the Afghan people to look at the, at the 
catastrophic nature of the attack on 9-11. 3,000 Americans were killed. And this is America, right? The most powerful military on the planet. And we go over there and we topple the Taliban regime, a, a completely discredited regime, more or less hated by the local populace. Um, we topple them without losing one soldier. More journalists were killed toppling the Taliban than soldiers, American soldiers. Um, and then for the next eight years, the effort is underfunded, undermanned. Uh, there were something like 15,000 American soldiers in Afghanistan for several years after 2001. Uh, there's, I believe, 40,000 cops in New York City. So if I were an Afghan, I mean, like, what, what's it take to get you people over here for real? Because we've been fighting in this country for a long time. 15,000 men is not going to do it. So what's going on? So now, after years of um, uh, sort of a diluted effort, I mean, it's getting ramped up now, but after years of an ine clearly inadequate effort, and I say clearly because the war is getting worse and worse, now we're saying, okay, well, this isn't working. Let's negotiate with the Taliban. I think for the Afghan people, it must be like, w wait a minute. What? I mean, are you, like, who si you know, ultimately, whose side are you on? I mean, I know there's a very paranoid theory in Afghanistan that the U.S. is actually allied with the Taliban, and this is all for show, and obviously not true. But, uh, you know, I do understand the, the sort of the thinking that leads, that has led people to that idea. At short answer, I did, was, did not report on the Taliban side, or I probably would not be talking to you right now. How about way in the, in the back? Just... Now, my question deals with the uh, emotional aspect of this situation. Now, our military personnel, they spent 15 months or more over there. And you said you spent, what, 30 days? Uh, uh, I did five one-month trips. Okay. As far as that is concerned, how did you release this emotion that you felt while there besides writing, or, do, or have you let it go? Uh, this, uh, this experience produced a lot of uh, emotions in me, a lot of new emotions. Um, there's the usual combat trauma. I mean, you can't get blown up without being upset about it later. I got very, very depressed after that. Um, war is very scary, and it's also very exciting. They're, the, they're very dominant emotions that tend to steal the show. Um, it's also, war is also a very, is a deeply sad enterprise. And when your reactions are up at the level of fear and excitement, you lose touch with the real sadness of this whole thing. And after the IED, I got in touch with that. And not, not on purpose, uh, it just happened. And it really, um, on just a kind of human level, like, oh my God, what, what are we all doing? I mean, we all, the human race, I meant. Uh, and um, as soon as the next firefight happened, that feeling went away. So there was that, but there was also um, you know, a little jumpy when I came home or whatever, but way more enduring, and I think for the soldiers too, was the effect of, the really profound effect of um, a bond with other people. So I came out of that experience, I didn't, I don't, I'm not bonding with Liberian child soldiers, I'm sorry. You know, it's not, it's not happening. I was out there for five months with those guys. I got very close to them. My inclusion in the group made me feel safe. Um, I felt very fulfilled that I could do something for them as a journalist. And I came home really quite moved by the whole thing. And um, when the soldiers come back, you know, they, a lot of them want to go back into the war. They can't make sense of their life here. Um, that's ascribed to a sort of hunger for an adrenaline rush. That's a small part of it. I think the larger part is this sort of intoxication of group inclusion. Uh, the intoxication of being necessary and loved by a small group of people, you depend on them, they depend on you, that is a very heady experience. I was touched by it as a civilian, but nevertheless, I was touched by it as well, and I came home <coughs> as quite an emotional person. And, you know, I, I would see people cry at weddings, and I'd be like, you know, when I was younger, I'd be like, what are you crying about? I don't, now I understand. And so the, the effect of the effect of that experience, some of it's traumatic, some of it is incredibly positive. Um, and, you know, that's hopefully the legacy that I'll go on with in my life as a person um, is, is, is that experience. 
Yes, I move to the front here. Could you comment on uh, the training of the people that you were with and their uh, mental toughness? Uh, I was not with the 173rd. I was not with Battle Company when they were training. Um, their airborne infantry, every guy in that unit chose to join the Army, decided he did not want to change oil on Humvees in a rear base, wanted to be in combat in a combat infantry unit, uh, worked very hard to get into Battle Company. Um, you don't just wind up in a unit like that. You really have to sort of fight for it. They were very proud of what they did. Um, I didn't see their training, but I saw the results of it. There were multi-day operations where the typical load that they were carrying was upwards of 140, 150, 160 pounds uh, at elevations starting at 5,000 feet on upwards, uh, extremely steep terrain. Um, and these guys could walk all day and all night like that. Um, I don't know what their training was, but it worked. They were not big guys. Some of them were 130 pounds. These were not big bruisers. Some of them were. Some of them were very small guys, and those small guys were the toughest, I think. Those small guys were among the best soldiers out there. Um, they really, I was sort of in awe of them, uh, physically. Uh, yes, back in the corner there. Yes. This is about three years ago you were there. I was there. Uh, 2007, 2008. Have you been able to follow any of the men in terms of writing them? Have any of them returned to their homes and how have they been able to enter? You said they wanted to come back, but the ones who are finished out, how do they handle reentry? Um, could you give us any idea about that? They came back to Vicenza where their base is. They called it Coward's Land um, because there were officers who had never been in combat who were ordering them around. It drove them crazy. Um, they all stayed in the Army. They all re-upped. The ones whose contracts were, came due, they all re-upped except for Brendan O'Byrne, who happens to be the guy I got closest to in the platoon, uh, happens to be the guy who was shot by his dad, a very, um, really interesting and thoughtful and, uh, and charming uh, young man. And we're, we're very good friends. He came home um, and just, I mean, it was like watching a, a plane crash into the ground. I mean, he just self-destructed. Um, not entirely because of his experience out there. He had a lot of baggage going into it. Um, and I think for a while he was really in more danger to himself at home uh, than he was during the deployment. The rest of the half the platoon is already back in Kunar province fighting. The other half is various military bases around the country. Uh, but Brendan, I mean, he's stabilized. He's okay now. Uh, I'm in touch with a lot of those guys, particularly Brendan. He lives uh, right near me. Um, he said something really amazing um, just a couple months ago. I, I, I had a dinner party with some friends, and, and I invited him, and uh, a woman, a friend of mine, said to him, um, Brendan, uh, I know how hard it was out there. Is there anything you miss about being out at Restrepo? And without any irony at all, he said, I miss almost all of it. You know, this is a guy who lost his best friends out there, who was almost killed out there, um, and he missed it. And I, what I realized is that the book that I had written, in it, I didn't know I was doing this. This, hap this exchange happened recently. I basically wrote a book about what it was that he missed out there. Um, why would it, what's out there for a young man that's not happening here in society that he feels is so essential to his emotional well-being that he's, risk, he's willing to risk being killed, <coughs> killed for it? Um, it's a very powerful question, and um, I feel that I answered it. Um, it's essentially the last third of my book, Love. Um, that bond, considering the family that Brendan came from, that bond became absolutely life-saving to him, and he was lost without it. There was, um, just quickly, there was a, uh, a study of soldiers in World War II, and it mentioned that I read, I read a lot of old studies, Army studies about courage and fear. You know, it's been studied, obviously. Um, they mentioned that there were soldiers who were wounded in World War II were brought to a rear base hospital uh, to recuperate, and that they would, go, they would go AWOL. They would literally climb out of windows in the hospital and go AWOL to return to their frontline units because they were so worried about their brothers out there. There is a um, related epilogue, interesting epilogue to your tale, of course, which is that the military recently said it was 
it pulled out of the Karengal Valley, which means that Restrepo is sitting there, no one's there anymore, right? Restrepo was blown up uh, by two waves of explosions um, uh, detonated by explosives ex ex uh, U.S. military explosives experts. It took two sets of explosives. The guys who built Second Platoon, who built the outpost, were extremely proud of that. That like <laughs> the army wired it up to be destroyed, and it did not. It, they, they, they had to. They had to do it twice. But how do the soldiers that just to follow up on yeah. her question, how do they feel about that? Have you talked to them about? Uh, yeah, I I have. They were really anguished about that. I mean, on the one hand, sort of intellectually, they you know they don't want to condemn the U.S. You know, the U.S. military to being at that hellish place for eternity. Um, more men dying there. They, they don't want that. But on the other hand, it was a very painful thing to see the U.S. military withdraw from the Korangal. Um, and the way they reconciled it in their minds, or failed to, I suppose, reconciled in their minds in different ways. Brendan, what Brendan said to some of his buddies who were discussing this, he said, um, look, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outpost. It's a 20-man outpost. We all knew it wasn't going to last forever. But uh, we fought for each other out there. We risked our lives, sacrificed our lives for each other in that place. And that you can't blow up, you can't withdraw from. That, um, that place has significance for us that's enduring. And you can't take that away from us. And, and I think, um, emotionally speaking, Brendan was exactly right. Uh, yes, here. Ian Wilkie, I'm a consultant and uh, infantry veteran. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, not going to Somalia. You were considering, I think, a, a book on, on that place, and uh, that's when we met some years ago. And yeah. Good yeah. to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. America needs you. So. Thank you. I was uh, reading your book, in particular, the, uh, the gunfight and uh, the references to the 50 caliber, caliber machine gun and uh, fighting for that and running for that. And, and I couldn't help thinking of a, of a piece by John Meacham in uh, Newsweek some time ago where, where he argued generally that America is kind of moving to a collective psychosis. We're becoming, in essence, a new Prussia. And I wonder if, uh, if in your experience with Battle Company, you don't mind switching for a moment to the macro and, and saying whether or not you might view post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of withdrawal from this this addiction to war that, that you saw uh, so close, and, and if there was um, a merit to that kind of an argument, maybe we could understand PTSD in a, in a different way. Um, I, I think there's real merit in that idea. I mean, at least just anecdotally talking to the guys that I knew, one of the most difficult things about I mean, not even rejoining society, just going back to a military base in Italy, was that they, uh, just a feeling of meaninglessness. I mean, in a platoon, in a place like that, every person is necessary for everyone else. Um, there's, a, there's a purpose, there's a high functioning that happens out there. And once you're adapted to it, it's an extremely reassuring place to be. You never have to question what other people think about you. Because as long as you are prepared to risk your life in their defense, they might not even like you, but they're okay with you. And you have a, 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 a um, completely certain position in the group. And then they come home, um, and everything's ambiguous. The relationships with their wives, their families, with their friends, there's no, um, there's no clarity. It's all relative. Um, they don't have a purpose that they can really identify. What am I, you know, what am I doing here? I mean, compared to pulling guard duty and watching over your friends in the middle of the night so that the outpost doesn't get overrun, which was a real possibility, compared to that, anything you could do in the civilian world um, with your peers looks pretty meaningless. And I think that there is a real trauma to that. Brendan said, you know, people think we um, drink because of the afterwards, that we drink because of the bad stuff. We drink because we miss the good stuff, and I think there's a real wisdom in that. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know much about PTSD as a, as a clinical disorder. I don't know how much, I don't know that much about the studies on it. Um, maybe army psychologists have figured that out and are and are dealing with it. I don't know. So over here, uh, Aaron Klein, also with Voice of America. We um, talked in a web chat between a couple of your trips to Afghanistan. I think it was in 2008. Oh, yep. Um, 
Talk more about your view on the extent of the human cost, the human cost of war in terms of death and injury, mental and physical. Um, God, I, I mean, that's a little open-ended. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's horrible. It can be horrifying, you know. Um, the soldiers themselves don't discuss it much. It's part of being a soldier. Guys get killed, guys get wounded. No one out there says, why is this happening? Um, if you're talking about the civilian population, you know, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Bosnia, or at least the places that I've been, the civilians ask, they, for a while they ask, why is this happening to us? And then they start asking, why is no one doing anything? Uh, I mean, my experience with war almost exclusively has been wars that were finally brought to a stop by Western military action or the threat of it. Um, so gearing up a Western military, um, for me, the associations I have with it, I understand that other people may have other ones, but the associations I have with it are sort of bizarrely positive. You know, fi you know 95, finally, NATO, led by uh, Clinton, uh, went into Bosnia. Quarter million people killed in Bosnia. And in, you know, two or three weeks, that war was effectively brought to an end. I don't think one NATO soldier was killed. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. Um, so, you know, when people, I mean, I may be meandering and not asking you a question, but when people say uh, war is terrible, it's, you know, we must stop war, and I'm like, you know, there are situations where you actually have to use the military to stop the war. Um, that has to be done really judiciously. I'm very intentionally not discussing, talking about Iraq at the moment. But in the wars that I've covered, uh, Liberia, they just got br a, a terrible suffering by people who don't deserve it was brought to an end by dis decisive action. And I think for a lot of journalists, and very left-wing journalists, I'm, I personally couldn't be more left-wing, but for a lot of journalists, they look at that kind of military intervention like, thank God someone responsible with some serious weapons is wading into this mess and putting a stop to it. How about way in the back? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I, um, I haven't read your book. I'm really looking forward to it. I just finished The Good Soldiers, which was a hard read. Yeah. Um, and I know about Rustamaya. But um, you said that you, uh, that they were there 15 months and you could get out anytime you wanted. Is that really true or were you there for those one month periods? I mean, you were, you were locked into the system. You couldn't just say, I'm going to walk out of here. That's my first part. Secondly, um, what was your uh, personal experience after maybe your third rotation in and out, going back the fourth time and the fifth time? What was happening with you emotionally as you returned uh, to that unit? And then the last part is, did you ever see a chaplain? Uh, you mean personally, or did I spot, <laughs> spot one out there? <laughs> there was a chaplain at the cop at the main base. Um, um, I, I don't think I really talked to him, but there was a guy out there for a while. Someone came out there, not to Restrepo. I mean, Restrepo was a two-hour walk up a pretty steep mountain, um, completely exposed to Taliban firing positions. Um, and so not a, lot of, not a lot of people who weren't in second platoon went out there. Um, um, well, on those last the fourth and fifth trips, I couldn't wait to get out there. I, I had gotten so close to those guys, I was so worried about them. Um, I was so worried I was going to miss something of significance to them and therefore of significance to me. I really couldn't wait to get out there. And, um, you know, but once I was out there, I mean, God, there was times when, I mean, two valleys up, Chosen Company got into some very bad fights. They sent out a 28-man patrol. Uh, they got ambushed. In three minutes, every guy was down. Every guy had a bullet in him, 100% casualty rate uh, on that patrol. Um, they, uh, one of their bases almost got overrun. The Taliban took over half the base. Uh, they were fighting inside the American bunkers, and um, the lieutenant, they were getting overrun. 20 guys were going to die, and the lieutenant called, in, you know, called the A-10 pilots on the radio and said, do a gun run right through the position. And the, A the A-10 pilots wouldn't do it. And he said, look, we're going to die anyway. Cut the position in half. And the pilots did, and it worked. 
that was happening very close by. We were at a 15-man outpost, uh, 15 to 20-man outpost. That could have happened at Restrepo very easily any day. So it didn't have to start happening for you to be lying there in your bunk imagining it happening and really freak yourself out. Some of the scariest moments that I had out there wasn't in combat when you kind of go blank. You just you get very functional and very blank. That's not fear. Isn't it just it did, you don't have time for fear in those situations. You do have time for fear in the middle of the night in your bunk thinking about, you know, the next time I, you know, I'm going to drift off to sleep and the next thing I know we might be getting overrun. That's, that's scary. And so I could work myself up into a pretty convincing argument that I should walk down the hill with the next squad switch out and curl up in a fetal position at the cop until the next resupply comes in. Um, that resupplies came in every four days, weather permitting or, you know, combat permitting. Um, and so you, all you would have to do is like curl up at the cop and wait for the next Black Hawk to come in. Uh, sir, here. Hey, thanks for doing this. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist too. I write Bob Dreyfus. I write for Rolling Stone and some other things. And Hi. as one, I don't know, left wing journalist to another, maybe, <laughs> you, you seem bizarrely untroubled by the fact that we pulled out of there the way we did, which raises this whole futility question of what are we actually doing over there. And maybe you don't want to answer the big question about what we're doing over there, but what were we doing in that <laughs> valley? For in the corridor? No, seriously, for yeah. three years. Like, you say the Taliban did this. I mean, do we know really that it was the Taliban, or was it just some local? Wasn't there a timber factory guy that didn't like us or something? And I mean, wasn't it just people fighting for their villages against the invaders? I mean, who, did, how much did these guys know that you were talking to all the time about who they were fighting and why they were fighting us and what this was all about? And then we just decide for reasons of big military strategy to pack up and leave. We don't need this valley anymore. And like all these guys died for nothing. So I mean, I, I take their emotional yeah. bonding and everything to heart. But meanwhile, the fact is they died for nothing. Whatever they think. I mean, they may yeah. think, oh, our hearts, we bonded together there, yeah. and we, that, that, that legacy is forever. But it, it's not. I mean, they, they died for nothing, right? I, those are really complicated, important questions, and I'll try to, uh, I'll try to answer them. Um, first of all, I think every war, tragically, has its useless piece of terrain that gets abandoned because people eventually realize it's useless. Um, the military commanders, they don't have perfect knowledge. They certainly don't, can't see into the future. They're changing their strategy to adapt to the enemy that's changing his strategy. It's a continually evolving thing. Um, for a while, the Taliban kind of pulled out of the Korangal. There was The fighting dropped way, way down because the Taliban were like, too many guys are dying there. It's not worth it. Um, so both sides are doing that. Dunkirk was a disaster. 30,000 Allied casualties at Dunkirk. Um, 30,000. I mean, that, I mean, that's practically the US, total U.S. force in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, w in some ways wasted lives, except eventually we won World, World, World War II. So I don't know, you know, I don't know how World War II would have gone without Dunkirk. I don't know. Probably better? Maybe not. Who knows? Um, the, the, the local reasons for being in the Korangal, as they, were as, ex as they were explained to me, I'm not vouching for their honesty. I'm just repeating what I understood out there. First of all, uh, there was a, there was essentially a, there was a very lucrative timber operation in the Korangal Valley. It was being sort of co-opted by the Taliban. A lot of money was going through there. Big timber, they were, they were logging. Um, it was essentially a timber mafia. They were um, very closely tied to the sort of higher Taliban leadership and, and Hig, Gubadin, Hekmatyar, all very, very interconnected. Um, the foot soldiers out there, some of them were just local kids who were paid $5 a day to fight. There were plenty of locals who hated the Taliban leaders in the valley, wanted it to work. The Americans were trying to build a road into the valley. They built a school. They're trying to get uh, water projects in there so kids wouldn't die of dysentery. Um, some of the locals understood that, that. And two Taliban leaders were actually overheard on the radio. You know, they chatted with each other on the radio, and the Americans would listen in. Say, one guy was saying, listen, if the Americans are doing all these good things for the local people, why are we shooting at them? These are two Taliban, Taliban com commanders arguing on the radio. The other guy was like, you're an idiot. We're, we're shooting at them because they're American. You know, it's like two very different <laughs> ways of evaluating the American effort there. Um, uh, 
But more specifically, the Corn Gall was not important. I mean, it's a dead end valley, six miles long, with a few thousand people in it. It was a uh, it was a sort of launch pad for attacks along the Pesh River Valley, which really was important. It was a major mobility corridor, a lot of agriculture, a lot of com commerce. There was a paved road. And from the Korangal, uh, fighters, a lot of them foreign fighters, come over from Pakistan, were using the, 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 were using the Korangal to attack the Pesh. And they were, they were disrupting commerce and mobility on the Pesh in a pretty catastrophic way. So what the Americans did when they put the base into the Korangal, they basically drove a stopper into it. And all the, all the fight, all the, all the attacks that were happening along the Pesh, which really was important, were now focused on the Korangal, which wasn't, they sort of absorbed the, uh, the attacks that were happening over a wider area. They ended up being the center of those attacks. And suddenly the Pesh opened up. You could drive down the road and not get blown up, not get attacked. Commerce opened up. The government came in. They, built a trade school in Asadabad to teach trades, uh, uh, teach the trades to young Afghans. Uh, some of the Korangali, young Korangali men from the Korangal went to that trade school. Um, right now, I can't speak for the military command. I don't know. Um, but I think, I think you could safely say, in a war with very limited manpower, the command is continually making choices about where can we best use these men. So when they pull out of one valley, and put them in another valley, what they're basically saying is they're going to do more good here than there. And both sides, the Taliban as well, can, are continually making those choices. Tragically, the places they pull out look like complete blunders and costly, bloody blunders. And they are, on one sense they are, and on another sense that is the strategy of warfare. It's always changing. Well, maybe this is a good place to uh, wrap up. Uh, I know you're going to hang out here and sign books, and you can hit them up for more questions. <laughs> Let me uh, thank Aspen for inviting me to come here, and thank you, Sebastian, for this conversation. My pleasure. Thank it was really fun.